With comic days away from kicking off a battleground state tour in Philadelphia next week, we're all waiting for the big announcement of her vice presidential choice. Expected as soon as Monday, according to campaign aides. Joining me now, Democratic Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, member of the Foreign Relations Committee, co-chair of the Harris campaign. I want to ask you about the Middle East, which with the crisis overnight and yesterday and Saturday. But first, Senator Coons, what, what are we going to see in Philadelphia? They are describing a unity rally. Some people might be assuming, perhaps erroneously, that Josh Shapiro, the Pennsylvania governor, is the choice since they're launching in Philadelphia. But Pennsylvania is so critical. Could a unity rally mean we would see all of these very strong contenders all together with the vice president and, and ticket, uh, the top of the ticket on, t on Tuesday in Philadelphia? Andrea, you are an excellent journalist, uh, but I'm not going to get into guessing about exactly who's going to be there uh, in Philadelphia. Um, it is the start of a swing state campaign uh, that is going to begin with a high energy, hopeful, positive and energized rally in Philadelphia. Um, Vice President Harris has a wide range of very skilled and capable potential running mates to choose between. Um, she's got, obviously, the governor of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, someone who has very high approval ratings and name recognition, who's been a strong governor and has a good record. Governor Tim Waltz of Minnesota, uh, also someone who is a strong governor with a good record and a great communicator. Uh, two of my colleagues I'll mention briefly, if I can, uh, Senator Mark Kelly, an astronaut, a jet fighter pilot, a decorated veteran, a successful businessman, uh, and who, with his wife, Gabby Giffords, has campaigned across our country for gun safety uh, and would be an excellent running mate, as well as Senator Gary Peters of Michigan, one of the other critical swing states, uh, someone with a great experience, a veteran, the chairman of the DSCC, uh, a friend and colleague who has um, a lot of the gifts needed to be um, the right chemistry uh, for Vice President Harris. We have a deep bench, and she's got a wonderfully difficult choice in front of her. Uh, the folks I mentioned and several others, uh, governors of uh, Kentucky uh, and our Secretary of Transportation and others. But at the end of the day, if you saw the rally last night in Atlanta, uh, what's happened is that Democrats are energized and engaged. Kamala Harris is finding her groove and delivering uh, insightful, funny, uplifting, pointed speeches. She is pushing back on some of the more unhinged things that J.D. Vance has said. And no matter who she chooses as her running mate, they will clean the floor with Senator Vance in the vice presidential debate. What do you think of Donald Trump saying that she would be a pushover, I'm paraphrasing, for Xi and Putin, and trying to get at her, uh, it's more than a dog whistle, on gender, on race? Well, if he thinks she's a pushover, then I wonder why he's walked away from debating her, as he knows all too well. She is tough and capable, direct, well-prepared and well-briefed. As vice president, she's met more than 100 heads of state around the world. She knows what Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin represent in terms of the challenge to the rules-based order. She's dedicated her life to advancing and defending the rules. And she is someone who, as president, uh, would fiercely defend American interests and take the fight uh, to those who are our challengers or adversaries around the world. And I would argue would do a far better job of it than Donald Trump, who from his first day as president showed he was not well grounded in knowledge about our alliances, our history, our national interests, and was a fawning supplicant before folks like Putin and Xi. I want to turn to the Middle East because the controversy over Gaza is, of course, one of the you know, problems for the Democratic president and now his vice president. She inherits that policy. And more importantly, the hostage talks were on the precipice of perhaps reaching closure. And now we have two targeted assassinations, one acknowledged by Israel, and threats of retaliation from Iran because of the assassination of the key Hamas leader, the negotiator in the ceasefire talks. In Tehran, just hours after meeting with the Supreme Leader, it's inescapable that Iran is going to feel that it has to retaliate, as well as Hezbollah, for what happened outside Beirut. And how can the hostage talks get, on, get back to square one when someone who was living in Qatar you know, hosting a lot of these talks has been assassinated. And I'm not saying that they're not both terror leaders. That's positive. But 
you have a lot of different equities. Well, Andrea, it is worth recognizing right up front that both of these individuals um, were recognized as terrorist leaders, uh, that um, the assassination in Tehran of the Hamas leader um, has removed from the battlefield someone who's a specially designated terrorist. Uh, the United States and many other countries recognize not just Hamas as a terrorist organization, um, but Hadiyah uh, as the leader of Hamas. Um, and. Israel has every right uh, to defend itself and to go after those who led the October 7th uh, brutal and murderous attack on Israelis and Israeli civilians and folks from dozens of other countries. Uh, but as you mentioned, it also then does bring to the fore the question about how to make progress on this uh, desperately needed uh, ceasefire and hostage release. Um, just last week, when Prime Minister Netanyahu addressed Congress, uh, my guests at that speech were the parents of Hirsch Goldberg Poland, an American who's been held hostage uh, in tunnels underneath Gaza by Hamas uh, ever since the October 7th attack. Um, there are so many hostage families, Americans and from many other nationalities, uh, who are waiting and urging Prime Minister Netanyahu to make progress in these talks. Uh, and this um, targeted attack against a Hamas leader may very well uh, put some um, barriers in the way of a quick resolution of that. President Biden has been a terrific leader on this issue. He has taken this hostage and ceasefire deal in front of the UN Security Council and gotten it unanimously supported in front of the G7 and gotten unanimous support and has applied pressure um, through Egypt, um, through Qatar on Hamas uh, and has urged Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, to close this deal and to bring to an end active conflict in Gaza. It is my hope that that is still possible. I won't get ahead of the classified briefings that we here in the Senate expect to receive in coming days about this attack. Uh, I don't know exactly who carried it out or what the consequences might be for this important hostage and ceasefire deal. And we're going to hear from the Prime Minister, uh, who of course was speaking here, and you were there for that. Um, he's going to be speaking in the next half hour or so from Israel yes. with his first response. Senator Coons, as always, thanks very much.